Awesome to welcome Alex Rama to the Basketball Podcast. Alex shares team and player development ideas for basketball coaches, teams, federations, and organizations all around the world. Alex's focus is on helping coaches stimulate their thinking by combining their personal and practical experiences with evidence-based coaching ideas. During the season, Alex is the head coach of College Prep in Italy. At College Prep, he also directs the player development program at the Italian club, which is renowned for producing some of the best players in Italy. In 2021, through Basketball Immersion, he released the BDT Offense, the world's first resource to help coaches develop their own conceptual offense from scratch using modern coaching ideas. Alex also previously worked for NBA Europe and continues to inspire us all with his practical applications of evidence-based coaching ideas, and particularly of late, his Twitter threads, where he connects so many dots for us as coaches, asking, is there a better way? I cannot encourage you enough to follow Alex on Twitter at Alex J. Sarama and on Instagram at Alex Sarama. Alex, welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on, Chris. Well, long overdue to have you on as a guest instead of just us collaborating on a podcast uh, where I get to ask you questions. And, and many of these questions come from, uh, you know, our our listeners, our supporters, uh, our members, and people on social media that have been stimulated by so many things that you've been sharing lately. So uh, let's get right to it with uh, one of the common questions I think you get is, within your methodology, how do you develop the ability for beginner players to shoot? Okay, I think it's a great question. And, And one of the biggest misconceptions is that using the constraint that approach only works with advanced players. So I think we have to look at how basketball players move. And I would suggest we start with some of Nikolai Bernstein's work on degrees of freedom, which is essentially the degrees of freedom problem is there are so many movement solutions and things a basketball player can use to move. Let's just take uh, shooting, for example. How is it a basketball player chooses and selects a specific you know, movement value and coordinates that to And that's kind of the observable skill that we see in games. So to solve the degrees of freedom problem, we basically look at the interaction of constraints and we'll get onto CLA constraint model later, but essentially with a beginner, they can still self-organize. And I shared a study on Twitter, I think a week ago, talking about self-organization within 18 month old babies who could self-organize their body to try and catch different soft balls thrown at different velocities. So, you know, when it comes to degrees of freedom, yes, beginners will typically be more rigid with their degrees of freedom. They're frozen. So for instance, certain parts of their body, they might not know how to use. Let's take the example of shooting a basketball. Maybe a beginner cannot kind of pair their, what they do with their jump, their knees with what they're doing with their shoulders, wrist and shoulder. So the degrees of freedom are frozen. I think it's the same for like if you if coaches picture a poor NBA shooter, someone like Shaquille O'Neal shooting a three throw, it just looks really rigid and awkward. So the idea is that basically we use these different constraints to get players um, expanding the different degrees of freedom, the different movements they can use. And this is basically freeing the degrees of freedom. So they learn to coordinate different parts of their body and they widen the solution space of different movements. So for me, this is obviously where the constraint-led approach comes in and why it's critical. I'd say it's even more important for beginners that as opposed to doing the traditional approach where we restrict them to one particular movement and that it's critical for me, but they expand it early on and can move in lots of different ways. I hope that that's clear. So for me, uh, with my daughters, what we're saying is uh, instead of trying to teach them many things within a shot when they're first learning to shoot, we're going to restrict them within constraints. For example, my major focus is just that they they lift it and they shoot it within their body. And then beyond that, I'm not giving them any other instruction because they have to find what's comfortable for them within that movement. That's absolutely it, Chris. And I think, um, and this stuff applies to, not just beginners, but any player. It could be an NBA player who's a poor shooter. And I think the biggest problem we see here is coaches have a mental model as to what skills look, skill techniques look like, like shooting. And this is things to, typically with lots of internalized points, like how the feet should be, the hand positioning, all these things. And the, the bottom line is coaches 
can't see what co- what players see. They can't feel what players see, and they don't know the individual constraints of each player because, you know, every every player is different. So instead, it's it's more a case of um, using you know a constraint led approach to allow players to you know narrow particular parts of the solution space, but critically they can explore and they come to their own conclusions as to what movements are working for them. So if we're talking about uh, that particular situation, we're essentially coming in with us as coaches as, with our bias in terms of what we think shooting should look like. And we are in a way imposing our solution rather than finding their solution. That's exactly it. And I think um, when we look at humans, we're complex systems. It's the, the concept of dynamic systems theory, which is a key part of ecological dynamics and the constraint that approach. And what that means is that basically as human beings, we are able to self-organize in the presence of various constraints. And that's you know the presence of task, individual environmental constraint. As human beings, we self-organize as kind of these constraints of confluence. And um, a key kind of misunderstanding, and I think something where a, a lot of coaches believe in is the idea that players have to explicitly be shown or taught a technique one on zero to then do it in an actual game and that's just absolutely not the case and that doesn't kind of align with any of the evidence and research we have um players of all ages and all abilities can self-organize in the light of constraints so you're using a few words here that i'm sure coaches are wondering what they are but uh mostly it's not about the words it's about the how and the process of that so let's go a little bit backwards here and let's talk about a constraint led approach and at the foundation of that if coaches want to look into this a little bit is newell's model which was created by carl newell and outlines three different domains that affect motor learning so how does newell's constraint model relate to basketball coaching and player development okay so great question i think I fully appreciate that some of the language is a, is a little bit complex. It, it is. And it, I think it's the key thing is that once coaches understand it, everything makes sense. And it's like you kind of view not just basketball differently, but life in general. So starting with Neuro's model, it's essentially the idea that skill uh, emerges and is kind of an emergent behavior. It's not a fixed property. Skill is the relationship between the player and their environment, you know, what happens in the game. So three different constraints. I think it makes sense to start with individual constraints. And these are things related to the player. And these could change either over long or short time frames. So for instance, things like height, weight, wingspan take a long, long time to change. And obviously with pro players, they're fit, pretty fixed. Um, whereas other things could change very quickly, such as fatigue levels, mood, um, so those are basically individual constraints. Then we have environmental constraints typically related to the environment. So it could be things like the playing surface, the uh, lighting, the humidity, temperature in the arena. But then critically, I think the most important part of environmental constraints is social cultural considerations. What's the family life of a player? What neighborhood are they living in? Maybe how far away are they, are they from the gym or from a youth perspective, what opportunities do they have to access great practices? Um, And then the most important ones are, of course, the task constraints. And I think looking at basketball itself, we have some fixed task constraints within the game, such as the rules of the game, the space that we have to play in. There are a lot of time constraints in terms of shot clock, game clock, eight second rule, three second rules. But then the one that coaches must know about is the task constraints they can use within their practices. So these are things like the number of players involved in a small sided game, the space that they're playing in, the point system used for scoring. And these are the ones which are most important. So the idea is that basically these, you know, these three kind of categories of constraint, they're always changing. And so skill emerges um, as a result of these interactions. And when you describe that, a lot of coaches are using these things without even knowing the power of these things or as much of the power of these things. And that's really what we're trying to highlight. But a lot of coaches use constraints without even knowing some of this background. And that's cool. Uh, I've always used that example that it's basically like you're, you know, the game basketball is played with a full buffet, but the constraints led approach restricts them from what they can eat at the buffet at certain times to be able to shape learning and those things that go with it. So maybe to bring it home, can you bring it a little bit 
uh, closer to home for coaches. And can you give them a basketball specific example of, uh, as to how we can understand Newell's constraints model with basketball case studies um, and the implications of this for, for teams at all yeah. levels? Yeah, because Alex, we're not just talking about NBA players. We're talking this is like never played basketball before on up to NBA players. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think the key thing with with the constraint led approach is um, I, I'm seeing some misconceptions with some coaches or some misunderstanding what a constraint is. And I think it's like Newell's model is not the CLN itself, because, for instance, a three man weave Specific, like you could look apply a constraint model to a three man weave because there are some task constraints there, but there's no representative information, i.e., there's no information within that drill with the same affordances that you have in an actual game. And we'll talk about affordances, I think, later on in the podcast. Well, and but, we'll talk about representative learning because okay, that's absolutely okay. the case. Yeah, agree completely. But I think going back to the question, I'll give two. I think I'll give two examples, one for like a youth coach and one for maybe a pro slash NBA coach. So youth coach, maybe you have two kids in your team uh, or your club. And one of those kids lives on uh, the 12th floor in a block of apartments with a single mom. And there's no like basketball court near them. So they can't really go and practice and resources at home are tight. So they can't really play many sports um, and they just do a little bit of basketball at school. But the kid wants to do more, hasn't got any brothers or sisters. And then maybe you have another kid who lives in the bigger home, has a garden with a hoop, has two brothers who they play with a lot, played a lot of sports growing up. Um, and maybe they have, they get access to a coach who does a lot of small sided games in practice, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole idea here is it's like um, the potential of the kids who didn't have the same affordances could be, amazing but they didn't receive those same opportunities and typically in a lot of the youth basketball kind of pathways we see they're very linear linearized with deselection selection things like this whereas in reality we need to embrace situations where we have as many as possible for as long as possible um so that's just obviously i think that gives a really clear idea as to how as coaches there's so much more that happens as opposed to just what we see on the core and obviously in the case of professional slash NBA players, there are so many examples of, okay, I think the task constraints are pretty obvious in terms of what they're actually doing in a player dev or team dev session. But I think critically, a lot of the social cultural constraints are interesting for teams to think about. For instance, how far is a player living from the gym? What's their friendship circle like? What were their experiences as a child growing up? And I think I did a blog on this, um, which I recommend coaches check out. And I used the examples of Ricky Rubio and Nikola Jokic, just because I know their backgrounds a little bit, because I worked with both of them in my, when I was at the league office and I did camps in their hometowns. So I know them pretty well. And I highlighted the role of environmental constraints and how they could have maybe shaped their journeys. So I think the blog on that is uh, it's, it was the myth of fundamentals. So coaches can check that out for a really in-depth example and a case study. Yeah, it, it's cool stuff to think about. And, uh, you know, for coaches, most relevant, as you said, is task constraints, because that's what we can specifically manipulate within practice and within practice design. And uh, that's a big thing. So um, what does this constraint led approach or where does this constraints led approach come in? And, and what are some of the key ideas around this that the coaches can understand uh, to use this approach in their practices then? Okay, great. So I think the key thing for coaches to understand here is it's not it's not coming from me and you, Chris. It's coming from researchers who have been studying this stuff for years. And, and basically, CLA is the key theory underpinning. It's called ecological dynamics. And uh, this is ba this comes from two theories: dynamic system theory, hence the name dynamic, and then ecological psychology, hence the name ecological. Combine those, you get ecological dynamics. So essentially what dynamic systems theory is, is the idea that as human beings, we're complex systems. So it means unpredictable, small changes could lead to huge differences. And specifically, it looks at how movement emerges as a result of self-organization, which we spoke about a little bit when we were talking about the degrees of freedom problem earlier on. So that's essentially dynamic systems theory. Looking at ecological psychology, it's uh, the idea, uh, a lot of this comes from Gibson and the idea of an affordance. And an affordance is an opportunity for action. And, you know, these are not affordances happen in day-to-day -day life and basketball. So um, I'll, give, I'll give a basketball example. I can give a day-to-day -day life example 
if needed. But I think the Barca one is most useful for coaches. So let's say um, there's a pick and roll and we've got uh, some different task constraints with the type of spacing. So say it's a shape pick and roll spacing. So there's the, the pick is on the left 45. There's one teammate, the single side corner on the back side and a two side on the front side. So that's one task constraint. Then the defensive coverage would be another task constraint. So let's imagine they play an aggressive coverage. So we have individual affordances. So for instance, the ball handler could spot the, the there's a show coverage and the picker's defender is coming aggressively. So they see, they recognize perception and action coupling. This is a key part of uh, ecological psychology. So there's information in the environment which shapes you know, what movement solution emerges. So maybe they use a bounce out dribble to create space and avoid that show defender. But at the same time, there's a shared affordance and the picker, the teammate, the guy sending the pick, sees the aggressive coverage and starts to slip. OK, and the now there's another affordance, and that is the, the ball handler recognizes that their player might be open on a short roll and they self-organize to come up with a pocket pass, avoiding the defense so they can't steal it to get that ball into the short roll. So it's a shared affordance. They both see it. Now there's another. This is what I mean about the game being comprised of affordances and how we can look at it through an ecological lens. Now, let's say in the weak side corner, they the defense starts to tag on that short roll. So they go to help to avoid the easy drive and dunk. So now another shared affordance, that play on the corner ghost cuts because they recognize the space, they perceive the space in the environment and the play on the short roll flows on how you pass, they dunk it. That's a complex way, but basically a way of help, helping coaches understand how everything in basketball happens based on perception, action, coupling and affordances. And we're, you know, as players, it's perception and, act, and action coupling. It's a continuous process. So a player will perceive to act, but they will also act to perceive because they obviously have to take in the information within their environment. So perception, action, coupling are the foundation of a lot of what we share. And that's essentially that you perceive, you decide, then you execute the skill. And so often as coaches, we teach skill first without perception and decision and then try and connect it later. And what we're essentially saying with a lot of the things that you're sharing here is that we can't separate them because you don't play with them separated and you don't need to separate them. And this yeah. comes to this whole idea of what is the idea? Well, what is representative learning and what is a representative learning environment, Alex? So I would say... Uh... Basically, in its simplest form, a practice whereby the same affordances that a player could expect to see in the game are present within that practice. And a key thing I'll just, you know, an easy way to understand it, if, if coaches, you know, haven't got the time maybe to really go into the science of ecological dynamics and the evidence, simply designing activities where you have these four things in every activity, the, a basketball, an opponent. So you've got offense and defense, a direction in which you're playing and a consequence, i.e. if you lose possession, say you're playing half court offense, maybe even in a one-on-one, -on -one, if you lose possession, maybe you just have a transition defense where you have to contain the ball to the half, right? Without even if you don't want to do the full trip or whatever. So for me, these are like the four foundational elements of the CLA, right? But easy to understand. So it's like any practice you're doing, can you have these four things. And that's why, like I said, something like the three man weave. Okay. You can't really talk about it being CLA because there's no representative information. Um, there's no then, defense. Yeah, there's nothing. Exactly. No consequence, no defense. Yeah. You know, and some coaches argue there's a consequence if you drop the ball or if you miss a certain number of layups or if you don't meet a time, then there's a consequence, which is running, but that's not what we're talking about in terms of a consequence. Exactly. We're talking about a consequence from the game. Exactly. And the, and the next phrase of the, of the game model. So obviously you've got, I call it a game model from football. We'll speak about it later, but you know, transition offense, half court offense, transition D, half court D, four phases of the game. Well, and, and honestly, improve and CLA, by the way, constraints led approach short form. But to, for most coaches, I mean, the simplest thing is to add a defender. And that's what we constantly tell coaches is just add a defender and exactly. uh, getting into different ways like that. So how does this, this approach vary to the traditional approach, uh, which is obviously still dominant within the basketball coaching yeah. world, but, but is becoming less dominant as coaches become more aware of the power of the CLA, et cetera. 
Absolutely. I mean, I'm really excited by it because, I mean, we're getting so many messages, Chris. And obviously, you know, we've already got members in our community, but I know so many coaches are obviously seeing the things we're sharing. And like as soon as they try the CLA, they see the difference and they see the impact it makes versus traditional approach. So I think, you know, what I mean by traditional approach and I mean, the scientific name for it is information processing. And it's basically more of the idea that humans are like computers so we have stored kind of movements within our brain that somehow we're able to suddenly execute at the right opportunity and obviously we know that's not how uh skillful performance occurs how it emerges um so traditional approach i'd say is typically characterized by a lot of decomposed drills so you know a lot of on-air work uh constant blocked practice so constantly repeating the same techniques a lot of internal feedback, uh, which is explicit, like instructing the players, you know, how, what the correct, supposed correct technique is and how to perform that technique. Um, and then I'd say also a lot of coaches who use the traditional approach would believe in things like muscle memory, which we also know isn't the case. So, and I, I think too, it's just on this note, I think it's impossible to combine the traditional approach and the CLA. For instance, something I'm seeing a lot is coaches now teaching a move traditionally and explicitly like one on zero and then creating a small sided game where maybe there's an affordance to use that move but the players have kind of really pushed towards using it that's not the cla because players aren't exploring the environment and coming up with their own solutions so i think we've got to be really clear as to what it is and i I did this whole thread on how a lot of the practices we see are like it's like taylorism with henry ford where it's like a factory a conveyor belt you know, players all being given the same checklist of moves, the same things, and then they expect a linearized process where they suddenly become better. But as we know, humans with complex systems, it doesn't work like that. So so here's the problem, and I'll I'll challenge you, because many coaches are still struggling with understanding why they would even need to consider these, because they're already successful, their teams are already winning, their players are developing. So what say you to that, Alex? I'd say... um, survivorship bias would be something to look at and um it's it's probably the reason why traditional coaching is so dominant today and you know i don't blame coaches at all it's like you know you try and put yourself in their shoes and it's like they've grown up with that for such a long time and i think it's really difficult to change and acknowledge that maybe the things you've been doing maybe there's a better alternative to the things you've been doing for so long so it's not i definitely don't want it to seem like it's a case of us and them and i think that's not what the basketball community needs at all because at the end of the day we're one community we're competing against other sports we should be as strong as possible but i think survivorship bias is essentially the idea where we see the stories of the successful coaches who win and we attribute their success to the drills we're doing but um they didn't have that success because of those drills. It was in spite of those drills. And also we don't see the stories of all the coaches who used the exact same drills and things like that, but didn't have that success. Um, so that's, and that's why I think there's so much tradition, especially just even within like, let's say NBA circles. I mean, obviously I know a lot of coaches now are starting to get on this stuff and implement CLA, but we still see a lot of traditional stuff because coaches are coaching how they were coached as players and it's a perpetuating cycle. So that's why I think it's so important that um, we, we try and be as informed as we can be by the evidence and bring that, incorporate that evidence into our coaching. Great stuff. And uh, you know, the key part, this is not a threat. This is something that can make it better, uh, better for the coach, but also much better for the athlete in terms of their experience. And uh, you, you know, Alex, you see me obviously working with my daughters and uh, essentially applying this, like I've never taught them a layup. But through the different things that we've done through constraints and et cetera, they've figured out they can do a layup and they don't always do a layup. And they rarely, if ever, do a layup with proper technique, according to the traditional approach, like the inside foot. Perfect. No, I mean, they can do it if that's what they are required to do, but they rarely do it as a pattern of movement or a memorization of movement. And that's essentially what you're saying. We can shape the ability to be able to score a layup without ever teaching them the specific way to shoot a layup. Absolutely. I think it's, you know, as human beings, we all have inherent biases. Kahneman has, written, has done a lot of work on this. Um, 
we all have these biases. And I think one of the biggest biases we have and the biggest kind of flaws in our thinking is the concept of these mental models that we have and the ideas we have as to what supposedly skills should look like. And I think that's the hardest thing maybe for coaches to grasp. It's trying to disregard those thoughts we have in our brain and really just, you know, kind of devalue your, the, the importance of your role for moving away from being an instructor to an architect of a task representative environment where the players are the ones coming up with these solutions. And I think that's what really, that's what it all comes down to at the end of the day. And just on, on the point with your daughters, Chris, I, we did that finishing blog last week, changing how we coach finishing. And, you know, I want to give some specific examples. Immersion members, if you picture smile one-on-one and around the arc, because I think those are two things we've shared recently, which give a clear picture. If you watch those videos, you will see how the beginners, and I purposely did this, these, these small sided games with beginners, they were self-organizing. Every single rep was different. And, and, you know, that's the true essence of repetition around repetition. It's actually impossible but to repeat the same movement because the constraints are always different. You know, thinking back to what we spoke about at the start of the podcast. So instead, it's all about creating these small sided games with clever manipulations of task constraints, uh, which lead to all these different solutions emerging. So do players really need fundamentals before playing games? Uh, This is a blog you wrote and you got tons of responses from coaches all over the world. And, you know, obviously some questioning, you know, your logic in this and everything else. But, you know, at the foundation of this is what is the problem with fundamentals, Alex? You know, really funny, Chris. I think, you know, one of the biggest positives from that blog was I was able to connect with so many coaches from other domains. And I think, we spoke about it at the time, the number of messages, like follows we had from coaches in soccer, lacrosse, tennis, it was insane. And it was really interesting just to hear about coaches experiencing the same problems with the traditional approach in their sports. But essentially, I think as coaches, this is a big statement, but I think we should actually refrain from using the word fundamentals because it's it's just the word clouded in ambigu- ambiguity. And it's like, it means a different thing to so many different coaches. So it's for me, it's the pro- the biggest problem with it is that a lot of the fundamentals coaches speak about are typically techniques which occur in a vacuum, i.e. a chess pass done two on zero, a shooting form done one on zero. And it's it's actually impossible in a lot of cases to repeat these same techniques in the game. So instead for me, it's, and I shared this example yesterday, taking passing as an example, Instead of fundamentals, I'm using the term functional solutions, i.e. is it a solution that works and solves the problem? Um, And in passing, you know, instead of there are an infinite number of solutions that could be used, passing in different locations, at different speeds, the teammates in different locations, different angles, velocities. So instead, I want to create an environment where all these things emerge. So it could be a two-on-two keep away, like a three-on-three American football where you can't dribble, you can only pass. Or it could be as simple as just playing three on three. But I basically want to create constraints which maybe nudge them towards passing. But every rep is going to be different because the constraints are different. And I want them to be experienced in coming up with solutions to solve the problem at hand, as opposed to the traditional approach of teaching them something very specific and expecting them to suddenly miraculously be able to reproduce that in the environment. And it's, you know, I use passing as an example. It's the same for anything, especially the thing I see the most trainers and player development coaches teaching one on zero like dribble moves or finishes it's exactly the same thing and it's like they're trying to apply all this terminology to all these finishing moves whereas you're fighting a losing battle because it's and there are an infinite amount of possibilities right and what matters more is the player's solution not our solution and to that example of the chess pass that's the easiest one for coaches to visualize because how much time did my coach used to spend on me throwing a chess pass from the center of my body to a teammate directly across from me and the reality is that pass never happens in a game because we're never chess passing directly in front of our body because there's a defender there and then our teammates never directly in front of us we're always exactly. passing to the side we're passing around So what's the point of teaching the fundamental, as you said, because you don't apply it anyways. Let's focus on functional movement solutions. Love it. Exactly. So what if players come up with a solution in the short term that might be effective, 
but over the long term, a coach or you or someone deems it to be probably ineffective. Example, shooting with two hands for a layup. Okay, so this is actually one of the questions we had from one of our members. I think it was Albert Tremonti. And basically an attractor in, in ecological dynamics, an attractor is a stable coordination tendency a player might have. Another example, because I had it this year with one of my players, a player who had a really slow release with his jump shot. And again, the reason why I believe he developed that was because he came from an environment where he did a lot of one-on-zero shooting and did a lot of shooting on a shooting machine. So obviously he had lots of time and he developed this coordination tendency, but then at the higher level of the game, especially when he came to us in Italy, we're playing against much better teams, his shot, he found it very difficult because obviously defenders coming, closing out, you got less time and space. Essentially, though, how we look at attractors is that the right manipulation of constraints can push players out of using these stable um, coordination patterns and discovering new ones. So let's give the example of shooting with two hands. Why is a player probably doing that? Well, firstly, I think we've got to look at the equipment being used. Maybe the basketball is too big for them or the hoop's too high, so they're using two hands to get more power. So obviously the most simple and the most important constraint for young players 12 and under is a lower basket and a smaller ball. But then of course, task constraints are critical. So we've got to design some type of activity where maybe there's a defender closing out from a particular location where it's not going to be possible to do that because if they do that, the shot's going to be blocked. So that's where we can create some type of small sided game where A defender is arriving from a particular location. Maybe there's some type of big or small advantage and the offense has to self-organize in the presence of those constraints to get the shot off. And obviously with the right manipulation of constraints, we can do it. And that's why, you know, it's not a case of doing um, more one on zero, all of this. It's just the right constraints. Players can self-organize, come up with a solution. So in the example, if we circle all the way back to where we started about my daughter's the focus on them just shooting within their body. If I start to go to a one hand form for them as an eight year old, the tendency is for them to start to hip turn or to start to get extra shoulder action into their shot and all these different things that become long-term problems rather than the thing that I was actually trying to solve, which is the two hand shot. And that's also the danger of this, isn't it as well, that we think we're solving something, but we're really creating a longer term problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's like at the end of the day too, I think, for any player who's any, like any player of any age, especially younger players, are they, I mean, there's a lot of research which shows even, you know, explicit internalized instruction. It's almost like impossible for players to remember and act upon it. So it's, it almost makes it completely useless giving that type of feedback. And then again, you know, players, player enjoyment is the most important thing. Is a nine-year-old really going to come home to dinner after practice and talk about beef shooting with their mom and dad or, or are they going to talk about the experience they had at practice the fun they had etc so it's like you know with cla most coaches were not going to be coaching nba players so it's like in that in that case why not you even if you don't agree with the theories behind it it's proven that it's more fun it's just it's common sense so why not use a coaching theory which is way more fun way more enjoyable for your players uh and they're just going to love their experience of basketball If you asked any of my daughter's friends that have never played basketball before their favorite activity at a practice with us, and it's two on one shooting. And we started, we started everything from the beginning with two on one shooting. So they never played basketball before and two on one shooting advantage shooting drill. Well, Alex, why do they like two on one shooting? Because they get to shoot, they get to make decisions and they get to experience success. And it's right. I mean, I didn't teach any technique before that. We just gave them a constraint. Either you're going to shoot it or pass it. That's it. It also builds a mentality of shooting, which is fun. And you constantly connect this back to the athlete's enjoyment. Tell us more about that. Well, I think two on one, it's one of those small sided games, which I would use for players of any level from beginner to NBA, because with the right constraints, it's so effective. And there are so many different varied affordances. So for me, it's like, especially when we look at shooting, I mean, I've done this big research project on it in terms of how I use differential learning in the CLA to develop shooting. For me to have a task representative shooting small side again, there has to be a passing option. So that means two on one is kind of the, it's the smallest format small side game you have to do. Because if, if it's a one on one, what you'll typically end up see, seeing is players taking poor contested shots, which is obviously 
not the goal of basketball. We want rob shots, range, open and balance that are high value on the team shot spectrum. So for me, two-on-one with the right con- task constraints can be so effective. Obviously, you can load it in. You can do two-on-one plus ones. There's all sorts of different things you can do with it. Um and, and, again, and so like, many of them on the website and in our membership community yeah. that, uh, you know, can connect people. But, you know, why do they why do players enjoy this? Why do why do your players enjoy these advantage shooting or these different types of task constraints? I think it's the unpredictability of it. And it's they know that it's not going to be a mindless practice. And um, they I think the biggest thing, too, I mean, this whole year, this is I'd say this has been the first true year in my coaching where I've been fully ecological. Other than differential learning, I haven't done anything without defense. And it's been an amazing experiment because the improvement with the players from September to now, I mean, it's been insane. And I mean, the players almost talk about it every day. And I mean, I'm very lucky because I have a lot of practices with them and they're kind of, they're 16 to 19 to 20, but they're very open-minded to doing it. And I mean, the they feel the improvement day to day. And of course, you know, improvement can be nonlinear. You have your sudden progressions and regressions, but they understand that. And I think the, the, the biggest thing, Chris, has been they really connect what we're doing in the practice to the improvement in games. And if the thing is really purposeful and clear. So for instance, our player development aligns completely with our team development. I think this is, that's something, one of the biggest things I see in the basketball world where I typically see player development is so separated and kind of in context completely different to how players will actually use some of those things in games. And I really tried to have a complete concise game model um, that makes, that gives a really clear purpose to everything we do. Well, we're so lucky right now because you are, uh, you, you've obviously been in the player development landscape, but now you're t- coaching a team and now you're getting a chance to be able to, uh, you know, tinker with the game uh, and be able to figure out some of these things. And uh, what are some of the takeaways for you uh, you're finding in this in this example of player development combined with team development? OK, so I, mean, I, mean, I want to start maybe with what I don't consider player development to be. Mm-hmm. And that is I don't consider it to be a catalog of techniques and specifically related to uh, techniques such as dribble moves or finishing moves, which is what we mostly see. That's that's not what I consider it to be because as we talk about skill, it's the relationship between the player and their environment. It's an emergent behavior. So for me, the player development has to be aligned with the team development. So for instance, whatever the head coach's game model is, whatever we're doing in the player development setting has to align with that. And, and for this reason, I see a lot of the work we're, we've done in player development this year a lot of it has been out of triggers. So it's all small groups. So I have maybe like four or five or six players. And I talk about complementary pairings. So instead of separating bigs and guards like you normally would, the game, I mean, at least how we play, it's comprised of several two, three and four person triggers, right? So we want to develop players. And we spoke about individual tasks and strengths at the start of this. Um, It's essential that, guards play against bigs and bigs play against guards in the player development setting. Because if you don't do that, you're not respecting the role of individual constraints. And what happens in the game, well, those are the matchups you see in every game. So a lot of our player development occurs through triggers. So it's it's completely integrated with how we actually play in the game. And I think the biggest thing I see is skill. a lot of skills trainers don't have an understanding of things like coverage solutions, triggers, and how things actually fit in in the game. And then surprisingly not surprisingly the things they're doing with their players often won't transfer because they're not the players aren't put in those representative learning environments so i think it's absolutely critical to kind of work back from how is it your players want to play in the game and then it's very easy to kind of come up with a lot of your player development i would say a lot of our player dev is we use guided defense a lot in those player dev sessions where i'm putting task constraints on the defensive players for how they guard so for instance, in a one-on-one, maybe it's a one-on-one finishing, they could overrun option A. Option B is they chase them behind. Option C is they try and do a neutral wall up. So what this does is obviously it naturally shapes different solutions. So the offensive player, the defense learns how to play at the same time. 
we could do it in a two on two or three on three or a pick and roll. Again, the task constraint is the defensive coverage is changing. The offense doesn't know what they're going to play against. So I think that is what a lot of our player dev looks like. And it's, it's more, I'd say it's very specific as opposed to general. I don't believe in giving them the same thing. So we create player development plans. The players have a, an ownership and a chance to contribute to that. And we look at ways we can actually measure what's done in the PDP, the player development plan. And it's the whole process is really thought out as opposed to just being a generic collection of moves, et cetera. And, and I may be wrong, but uh, like I never defined it as player development or team development. I defined it as practice. Like there's no difference. I mean, it's, it's all trying to help them be better in the game and to help our team succeed. Exactly. And that's why I don't like the word skills trainer because I, I just think we're, I'm a basketball coach. You know, we're all basketball coaches. We coach basketball. Basketball is a complex system. And it's, you know, it's not, that's, that's what it is, you know? Yeah. And, and, and again, this isn't a knock on skills trainers, but if, if I was a parent and I had someone working with my daughter, um, I would be immediately asking them, okay, how is this helping them in the game? And are you, are you teaching things that are helping them in the game? And that would have to be my evaluation on the effectiveness of the skills trainer. Is there, are they helping them connect not just skills, but skills and decisions to the game? What else would you be asking a skills trainer or looking for in a skills trainer? Because we know people are going to go to skills trainers still. I'd say small group sessions over individual sessions. So it's task representative. Needs Um, to be more players than just one there. One on no skill development, not that effective. Essential. Um, And so lots of two on twos, three on threes, uh, different varied affordances, avoiding teaching explicit moves and just creating that environment where lots of different things are emerging. And, and that would be it for me. So for, for coaches, I mean, all access basketball player development workout. Alex has put it on YouTube, on the basketball immersion YouTube. He's got some other all access practice kind of stuff on there as well. I, I encourage you to go check it out. But uh, Alex, maybe for those that haven't watched this yet and uh, those that need to watch it, if you are doing an individual workout, what would this look like? Okay, so that's a great question. And I actually have some players at my academy who I do do individuals with. And the reason why I do that is, number one, I think it's amazing for the relationship with the player. And I I really, really value that. And I think sometimes the importance of transformational coaching and all this gets lost in some of the science behind the CLA. Number two, the players ask me for it. So, you know, I want to make sure they're happy. And number three, um, I think for shooting, especially with the differential learning shooting stuff I've done, it can be useful. Um, But critically, in these individual sessions, I'm not teaching specific techniques. And I can still apply the concepts of repetition about repetition in an individual workout. And that's exactly what I do. So I can still make it unpredictable um, through the way I kind of design that that individual. Um, Sometimes... I play guided defense because I mean, I'm, I'm six foot three. So for some of my players and I can move just about well enough to kind of pair some of the affordances that they're actually going to see in a game. So the benefit of the individual is also that it's very time on task, right? They can get a lot of uh, repetition route repetition in an hour. So I would play guided defense to give them different cues, but still basically throughout that whole workout, it's, it's rep, 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 and it's got to be fun. So I let them play their own music um, and it, it can be useful. But the key thing is, I think if you can, trying to get some sessions where you have another player to really create the real performances that will be present in the actual game. You mentioned the term differential learning. Can you just explain that quickly? Absolutely. So it's not the same as the constraint that approach. It's basically the idea that as the coach, you're giving the players lots of different movements. And a lot of these movements will be things they never use in an actual game. But the idea is it's all related to the degrees of, degrees of freedom that we spoke about at the start. So basically, you're expanding the solution space because the players naturally have to coordinate their body in different ways to solve some of the tasks. So it, to give an in-context example for shooting we shoot out of different stances. So like wide, we change between like wide, narrow, staggered stances, different arcs, um, different part, receiving passes in like weird places. 
be have shooting with contact in different places, maybe shooting with a hand blocking your eye. So, you know, some of these things they will actually do in games, but the biggest thing I've I've noticed with it is it it really helped the players become more adaptable. And they can a lot of my guys now can actually shoot really well in different ways because obviously the constraints are different every time. Um, so I think for shooting, I don't really see a use in differential learning for anything in basketball other than shooting, but for shooting, I think it can be really useful. Well, it, it, it speaks to, again, what's the point of trying to perfect skills or fundamentals because you rarely use them in a perfect way. And that's what it speaks to, right? I rarely catch it with perfect footwork. Uh, yeah. Even the best shooters in the world have variable footwork on the catch. I am curious about this example I shared on Twitter the other day, and maybe you can help us understand the value. I th think two things. One is I had my daughters at the playground and I said, listen, here's what we're going to do. As many different ways as you can figure it out, go between your legs and shoot in different ways. So it was one dribble between their legs. And then I, that's all I said. So the goal was them had to create the solution on their own thereafter. And then they had to figure things out. And a little bit of that is the differential learning that you're applying, right? That's that's where I, I would class that as, as DL, differential learning. Yeah. Um, I think it's like, you know, you're basically destabilizing some of their key coordination patterns and they're self-organizing to look at new ones. So, and I think it's, it's, it's interesting. I think one thing to consider is I, I could learn this term from some skill acquisition, the guys who run skill acquisition Island, and they, it's a term called Maya most advanced yet acceptable. So I think for some of these things, it's like, especially in youth players, you can do this all, no problem. Some of my guys are really good, like national teams already. And some of the DL variations are quite frankly a little weird so it's you know you have to know what's right especially like in the, if coaches wanted to do this with pros or nba players i think you have to start with the ones which maybe get them used to the concept of it for instance i'll do like bad passes and random closeouts right because i think players can see a value to that and naturally they're going to self-organize differently i think if players really bought in then i could do some of the weirder ones like sometimes an isometric hold for like 60 seconds into shooting or changing the lights in the gym. But I think it's Maya most advanced to accept the words key because you don't want to, you don't want your players to be uncomfortable and you certainly don't want to lose them and, and give them things that they don't really understand or see a value in. And uh, to, to help them obviously co-create solutions and also find solutions on their own and the stuff that goes with that. And uh, building from this differential learning concept is this research project, this big research project that you're working on on shooting. And uh, can you share more about this? Absolutely, Chris. So basically uh, over Christmas, I mean, I, I, re I try and read like two or three papers each week, mostly focused, I'd say, on recently a lot, well, a lot of ecological dynamic stuff. But I was really getting into differential learning in January and I accessed a bunch of studies which have been done on shooting. And it was insane how many uh, studies have been conducted in, in shooting. Um, and I was basically working on a whole project as to how we can coach shooting in a way which aligns with nonlinear pedagogy, i.e. like CLA, differential learning. Um, and I was kind of looking at, looking at some of the, the problems we have in shooting right now and then coming up with all the small-sided games and differential learning tasks we could use to develop better shooters. And I, I think it's key because, I mean, even here in Europe, like a lot of the top academies I see, for some reason now, shooting has really declined over the last few years. I think, I think a key part of it is shot selection, like players taking low value, heavily contested shots. But also I think it's because of the way we coach shooting with the traditional approach, i.e. lots of form shooting, one on zero, players always know where they're going to be shooting from. It's predictable. So we've got to figure out kind of what to do with this project, but I'm really excited by it because I think it could, I think shooting is the one thing in basketball, which is most hindered by the traditional approach. And this is obviously a completely different way to approach it. And, you know, a lot of it, we already have on immersion, like the two on ones, things like that. And it's really just kind of looking at how I view shooting through an ecological dynamics perspective. 
Yeah, it's it's awesome stuff. And I'm so glad you're doing that. And uh, so glad you're working with a team as well, because, again, that seems to be the challenge for some coaches. They think there's two boxes. There's a player development and there's a team development. And it's just not the case, is it? And that's another kind of thing that we're trying to break down for coaches, understanding that is that shooting happens in the context of the game, even though it's probably the most individual of all the skills in basketball. It still happens before a decision, doesn't it? Absolutely. And that's the biggest thing, Chris. Like I, I coached in, in one environment where it was like that and it was really separated between what team coaches did and the skills trainers. And it's just it's impossible because everything has to be so coherent and close. And if you're not aligned, it's just it, it doesn't work for that reason that you've just explained. Um, so everything has to have a context and coaches really have to be on the same page as to, you know, how things actually happen in games. Well, what gets them to the same page? Well, this game model, right? So the game model, uh, you've spent a lot of time working on your ideas around conceptual offense. Why is this becoming such a popular style of play? Uh, the BDT offense, uh, particularly that you shared. Okay, Chris. So I think um, looking at dynamic systems theory, and so let's just rewind to that. We acknowledge that basketball is complex. We can't control it. And the biggest problem with a lot of the traditional offenses we see, like continuities, really react and running set plays rigidly through to the end, right? Without looking for the advantage and like the first action within the set. The problem is coaches are trying to control the uncontrollable. And, you know, the number of possibilities, like I said, we're in basketball are insane. So instead with the conceptual offense, it suits the ecological framework because the idea is can players adapt to the constraints present in each, you know, during each offensive possession to generate an advantage and get a high value shot. So it's preparing players in their practices for what actually happened, what the nature of the game is all about, as opposed to trying to control the uncontrollable. So um, for me, it's, it's great because the CLA approach aligns perfectly with this style of play. I think it's impossible even to run like an old school continuity offense or run set plays and expect players to run the whole pattern and do the CLA. They're just not in, in connection and in, in alignment with each other. Um, and I think just the biggest things I've seen is, I mean, I've done this. So we started in, on the 1st of September and a lot of my players came, they all came from traditional backgrounds, but the, uh, it's just amazing to watch them play basketball now because of how adaptive they are. So, and I shared a big thread this week. And I mean, we do, of course, we have a structure. So we have spacing templates, known spacings. We have a choice of triggers and we have some coverage solutions that we do clearly emphasize as a team. But the key thing is it's the players are deciding on these. I'm not calling it from, from the sidelines and the, the solutions they're coming up with, they're able, they're attuned to the affordances. So they're in a lot of situations, like any type of defensive coverage we see, the players are coming up with amazing solutions every time to create that advantage. And it's for the player development piece too. Obviously, a lot of my players want to go on to professional careers or NCA careers or both. And I really like to think that any, any kind of environment they're going to be in after this they're going to be, a, be able to adapt to that environment instantly because they understand basketball and they understand all the triggers and things that might be, even if it's a traditional playbook, they at least know how to play with those triggers involved in, in those sets. Um, and it's it's been really fun just to see, you know, the BDT offense community grow. I think we're, we've got a lot of scope to keep growing as coaches kind of find out more about it and see the benefits of their players using a conceptual framework. Uh, the conceptual offense or uh, conceptual offense.com to go there to find more for that. And uh, you know, um, I think it's a Bobby Knight quote, teach them how to play and don't teach them plays that type of idea. You know, I, I go farther and I'll share this basketball decisions supersede basketball plays. And that's essentially what we're saying here is the decision and what you frame so well is taking advantage of advantage. And that should supersede everything. And that's the whole point of offense is to take advantage of it. And the whole point of defense is to take away that advantage. So that's really the simple way of being able to understand it. But really what you're doing is you're adding evidence-based ideas behind this conceptual offense, right? Absolutely. So applying like evidence-based ideas to how teams actually play basketball. And I mean, it, the whole game model I've studied, it actually comes from soccer, from a 
guy called Vito Frade, who heavily influenced Jose Mourinho, one of the most successful soccer managers. And a lot of those ideas are actually dynamic systems ideas. And I mean, the essential idea with a game model is that you have, we have four phases of the game and it's really, we, we train those four phases together and players really understand what, what kind of our concepts and frameworks are and our aims within each phase of the game. Um, and, you know, it's not a case of training these things. I don't believe in training these things separately. So a lot of the times in practice, when we're doing our small study games, we're playing with trips. So we get all phases of the game involved in one task, as opposed to doing these drills for separate phases. And I, I view that as reductionism. It's not, it's we, we we're developing everything together at the same time. So another thing that coaches notice um, is your ability to be able to connect so many di- these ideas for players around video games, around uh, Harry Potter, around all these different kind of connections that relate to players. And obviously you're a young dude, but uh, you, you put a lot of work into this to be able to understand some of these things that connect for players. So how does connecting a video game or video game design within practice help your players? Excellent. Yeah, I'm I'm six years older than my oldest player, so I, I could definitely relate to some of the guys, to a lot of the guys. But I think it's for me, this all comes down to the environment and practice and making the whole experience really fun. And I think this is so so important. And one of the biggest kind of beliefs I have with the academy, it's I want to make it such an enjoyable experience for the guys to come to a gym every day. And obviously, CLA aligns with that but it's also kind of how I shape that experience to them, how I interact with them, my sense of humor, and obviously the things we're doing in the practice. So um, just like I was looking, thinking about video games and why is it that, that they're so fun? And it's, you know, it's the right level of challenge. There's no excessive instruction. Players, when they fail, they can immediately start again. And then I was thinking of just, well, why can't I bring video games into the actual practice environment in a task representative manner. So Fortnite is basically the idea of uh, the start of Fortnite when uh, when the player, when you come down on the parachute, you collect these different weapons, right? Which you can then use in the upcoming battle. And we use the weapons as a metaphor for the coverage solutions. So let's take pick and roll as an example. Um, we have a lot of coverage solutions. So it could be, I'll just explain a few, it could be like reject, slips, flipping the pick, twist, veer screen, relay pass, pass ahead, skip passes, boomerang pass, right? Those are just some some that come to mind. So the idea is Fortnite, we're playing, you can play it with three trips. So you have one trip to start, a half court offense, a trans a transition and another transition. So it means it's task representative. You could do it three on three, four on four, five on five, whatever. And the constraint, you, you've you got to win, to win the Fortnite, you've got to get a, uh, start a domino sequence using a specifying number of coverage solutions, i.e. AKA the weapons. And once you've collected seven weapons, you win. So it's amazing because the players naturally start, they're, they're pushed towards using these, but they have to, they still have to apply them in the right context. But critically it's task representative because for every four points they get, not through a pick and roll score, they can cross off any weapon they use. So it's not over constrained. It's still representative. And it's amazing because it really gets them thinking. What do they still need? What are the best spacing templates to use? What works against particular coverages? Um, so that's an example of Fortnite Battleship would be, it's like the board game Battleship. We have all our fast and slow triggers. So fast triggers would be things with typically on a stop, but anytime kind of a tempo is fast, we're bringing the ball up quickly. So it could be a get, a pick and roll, screen away, flare or pistol. Slow triggers would be when the game slows down. So typically three and four person triggers, like a, it could be like a stagger, double drag. But anyway, battleship is you've got a score using a particular trigger in different locations. So say for instance, take a get, the first team to get five strikes using a get in five different locations. So again, this is a great example of the CLA players learning in a fun way to mix the triggers up in different locations. So we're deceptive and it's really fun at the same time. Fun keeps coming back to that. It connects ideas and uh, it makes it fun and engaging for players and uh, tremendous. And uh, one of your values is definitely being divergent. And uh, that's certainly applied to some of the warm up, warm up ideas you've been sharing as well. Can you explain some of the rationale behind these? 
absolutely so i'd act, i'd also connect these back chris to the um to the degrees of freedom ideas that we spoke about from bernstein essentially how i view the warm-up is i want to open up my players degrees of freedom get them moving in lots of different ways so the problem with traditional warm-ups is players do static stretches and they're always moving in the same way so placing pressure on the same joints it's not actually preparing them for the chaos of the game and what happens so the idea is i'm also giving them a great amount of ownership so it, it kind of ties into self-determination theory they have a lot of autonomy so i give them different props and they basically have to invent different games and ways to move using the prop so a number of varied movement solutions is incredible it's really fun for the guys and they're opening up their degrees of freedom and it's you know it's not just the the props and the equipment the warm-up would typically end with like tag or some type of one-on-one or two-on-one which has the same affordances that they're about to see in the real game and it's you know, it's so that's why we get the crash mats out, all these different things. And even pre-game, it's exactly the same. Again, you have to think Maya. You know, I some of my guys are a little bit uncomfortable at the thought of doing a crash mat before playing a, a big under 20 European club. But sometime sometime I'd like I'd like to see if they want to do it. But um, you know, the whole idea with the warm is just can we develop players with better movement solutions, which will then transfer back to when they're playing basketball. It's fun stuff. And uh, again, your players enjoy it, but also there's a purpose to it, uh, which is getting players to move in ways they don't normally move. Right. And that that exactly. also comes back to that differential learning concept, which is you're trying to get players to be able to uh, be comfortable with adaptability. What would your advice be for coaches who are interested in doing more research and integrating evidence, evidence based ideas, informed practices into their coaching? It's a great question. I mean, I think it's really important because it's for me having an awareness of the evidence. It's just, it's made me so much of a better coach. I think it's too, as coaches, we typically spend a lot of time in particular areas such as X's and O's, breakdowns, scout reports, et cetera. And I'm not saying that's not important, but it's like, for me, with my knowledge now of ecological dynamics, I, when I'm watching film, I approach it completely differently because of the knowledge I've gained from an ecological lens. I think having a routine is really important for self-study. And this is something that I'm, I'm you know, I've, I feel sorry for a lot of coaches in Europe, especially in Europe, because kind of the environment of clubs, it doesn't allow them to have this opportunity for self-study. And I think that's so important, like to, to have that chance. I'm, I know so many coaches who really, really want to learn, but the problem is they're so busy given it being, you know, with their work schedule and what they're being given from the clubs, there's just no opportunity to do it. And I think that's, the, that's why we're in the situation we're in where the game definitely need it's, it needs coaching innovation. But the problem is a lot of professional coaches are being so tied up that they don't have a chance to do it. So for me, it's like, I'm fortunate in terms of with the academy that I, I have three hours a day for my study. And it's like everything I do with how I design my day is kind of to prioritize me being in the best state of mind to learn. So it's like trying to eat well, exercise, mindfulness, sometimes get a massage. I have like a pretty regimented day, but it really allows me in the mornings when I'm most sharp to do all my reading. And then it's like the process of I have a whole archive. So I have everything printed out in folders and I obviously have everything in concise folders on my laptop. So like podcasts, all the immersion podcasts I listen to, for instance, the really good ones, I'll listen to twice and have notes on them. Um, when I'm reading books, I have, I type the note, notes up and I revisit them frequently. So it's trying to basically kind of align, think of ways where I can retain the information, come back to it at different points. And then critically, have the opportunity to apply it to my coaching. And I'm obviously I have, I, I mean, I'm on court each week, maybe about 10 to 15 hours practices. So it's a lot, which is perfect because then I, I can apply all the things I'm learning each morning. It's great stuff. And uh, you know, as, as you say that, I mean, I'm talking about coaches that don't have time to do it. That's why we created basketball immersion, like this one-stop shopping to be able to learn these methods and, uh, you know, through courses, through video learning, et cetera. But also for the coaches that we both coach privately, uh, when we coach the coaches, I mean, our goals are to add to what you do, to make over what you do, or 
in a lot of cases to remove from what you do and to remove the fluff and to get more to the point. And I think that's been the biggest impact from what we've done, especially with some of those private clients, isn't it, Alex? Absolutely, Chris. I think two biggest things for coaches is just to be critical because like one of the things which I, I feel such a weight of responsibility. Let, let me say critical doesn't mean a bad thing. And too often we think critical yeah. is bad, right? Critical analysis is not intentionally and intended to be a bad word. No, completely. I mean, I feel a big weight of responsibility to ensure that the things I'm sharing are as accurate and evidence informed as they can be. And I think sometimes, you know, I like, for instance, I saw like an online platform last week talking about muscle memory. And it's like, then for me, that's the one thing which you which brought it up like, quick. Talk about muscle memory that it doesn't actually exist. Talk about that. No it just it just doesn't exist it's there's i don't know where it came from i mean it's impossible the ability for our muscles to remember moves it, it's it, it goes against all the work bernstein did repetition repetition degrees of freedom etc and it's like you know as coaches we we have to see some of these things and i think we don't we, sh we shouldn't be afraid to really think you know is this information i'm receiving accurate is this book i'm receiving like you know i'm reading a lot of books and a lot of the things sometimes in them I, I take the pieces i like and i adapt it to what i to the evidence i have from an eco ecological perspective so we can't just absorb everything and take it in i think we have to be very careful with all the sources we look at and really think you know is this does this align with the philosophies and the things we know about skill acquisition and motor learning um, for for coaches that are curious then give us take us into your learning process Okay, so um, I watch m most of my practices back. And I, to be honest, now I don't watch any film. I had a big, like, there was a period of about two years where I watched a lot of film on Synergy. I don't watch any film now. And I, I will get back into it eventually, but I've just found I've made so, I've learned so much more and improved so much from my coaching, going more into the research papers and going down the ecological route and then review my practices. And that, that's that been the biggest growth area for me. And I think my biggest concern, just like we share X's and O's, but we annotate it and we talk about some of the affordances within those. And I think for me, I was thinking, I'd actually like to start sharing X's and O's that don't work and looking at missed affordances and things like this, because I think we sometimes view the game from a, an X and O perspective. And I think if we invested as coaches some of the time into learning like ecological approach our players would be so much better our teams would be so much better and i think i mean it's, it's exciting because obviously you know the in the nba world i think this is gonna take off obviously the orlando magic have uh the first nba team to like have an actual member of staff um specializing in motor learning i think teams will catch on to this and the difference will be amazing as these evidence-informed practices are brought into the basketball world at all levels. Well, and then hand in hand in this is that, again, we're trying to do this in a very positive way. Uh, we're trying to share as we literally share the game and talk to us about the importance of positivity in all this as we shift the global coaching landscape. Positivity is absolutely essential. I, I think I'm we can never berate or belittle coaches who may be uh, doing things traditionally. And it's like, you know, when, when we reply to stuff, it's like, you know, I can be direct, but I'm just going to state the evidence. I'm not going to give my opinion. I'm going to state the evidence and maybe I'll give someone a link to a study on something or link them to, to a research body, which exists. And I think the biggest problem is when we try and bring opinions into it. I think when we're trying to reply to things, I think, just you know, sometimes we do have to put ourselves in the shoes of coaches, other coaches, try and see it how they see it. But then, you know, if, if, if they're really disagreeing, I just, you know, some of the responses we get on Twitter, I'm very matter of fact, because how I see it is I don't want to lose that coach and have them like an enemy of the CLA. I'd love them to, you know, to still respect our ideas that we share and make, maybe we keep the door open at some point in the future for them to enter the wonderful world of ecological dynamics, as opposed to closing that door straight there and then, and then, the players they work with lose out, the whole game gets worse. Yeah, it's just, uh, I say it like, uh, to ask questions is the easiest way to do it. Like to, to remove a lot of threat and a lot of confrontation is just ask questions and listen to answers. And uh, that goes both ways. 
um, as we try to seek to understand and positivity in this process. And, uh, you know, anyone that brings up the argument, you know, for the three man weave, I simply ask them to show me the evidence about how it transfers information to the game, because ultimately that's it. Because what I do know is basketball transfers to basketball. Yeah. And I'm not sure drills transfer to basketball uh, by and large. And that's a big thing. And when we talk about drills, we talk about on air, uh, you know, type of drills with no defense. Um, what are your biggest takeaways then from your experience of the NBA league office days? I think um, I, it was great just to get an insight into that world. And I, I had an amazing team to work with, really just having the chance to travel and, and all that at such a young age. It was, it was great. But I think it made me really um, firm in my beliefs and my desire to really go deep into this evidence base and kind of change the conventional thinking. And, you know, for me, I was really comfortable there. And I, it's a job I could have stayed in for years, but I, I didn't want to be a coach who just got a, got a job with like an NBA team or whatever because of networking. That's really not me. I, I dislike small talk immensely. And I, I wanted to really have my own ideas and bring things to the table, which people value and they see the creativity in my coaching. And it made me really, you know, I think sometimes we can't be afraid as coaches to, to enter an, an unknown, unknown world and try things. And for me, the next step I went after the NBA, it didn't work. Right. But then I landed where I'm at right now in Italy. It's been so fun and it's, I've never been happier, Chris. And it's, for me to be able to have like intellectual freedom to share our ideas and have a platform for that is so fun as opposed to maybe being constrained to doing things a certain way, which was how it was when I was in the league office. So I think that freedom is, is really, really important. And that's why I love the platform you've built with immersion and the opportunity to keep sharing the game in this way and just to keep learning and keep applying things immediately and bringing it into my daily coaching practices. This applies to players too. It's hard to be creative without freedom and saying that, and that's what you frame so well throughout this with the conceptual offense, especially is that freedom comes from an initial structure and then gradually you get it. And this is really the path that I'm so grateful. We're all grateful that you left the NBA league office to be able to share these things with us and obviously to share within our community. We're so much, so much better coaches because of you. So thank you, Alex, so much for being able to share so much with us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much, Chris.